Everyone, please take your seats. We'll get the program started. Democratic League. On behalf of the Plumber County Democratic League, its members, we welcome you uh, to candidate tonight. Um, let's all start off by saying Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you everyone for being here this evening. We have a good night of candidates um, to talk to this evening. Uh, let me start off first by saying thank you very much for everyone being here. I'd also like to say to our board and our offices, uh, thank you so much for all the work you're doing to put this together. I'd like to especially thank John Bowes, who's done so much work for us to put all this together. Thank you very much, John. Thank you, John. John Bowles has been fantastic with the lead our outreach officer. I'd like to start off first by introducing uh, candidate for lieutenant governor and the mayor of Salem, Mayor Kim Driscoll. Thank you, George. And it's so great to be back in this room again. Last time I was here, we also were having a Democratic event. Just want to say how grateful I am for the folks who are showing up, carving out time to hear from candidates to give us a chance to share a little bit why we're so excited about this opportunity. I'm the mayor of Salem. I've been mayor of Salem for 16 years, fortunate and blessed to work in a community that's so welcoming and inclusive. Prior to that, I worked in the city of Chelsea, first when they were coming out of receivership, first as their chief legal counsel, and then later as their, uh, their deputy city manager. Really gave me a bird's eye view into what it means to have professional government, and frankly, who pays the price when, they're, when they're, that's not the case. But I ran for mayor in Salem, intent on making improvements in our community, wanting to see government operate in a more transparent way, and certainly put Salem on the map towards fiscal recovery. 16 years later, Salem is a hip, historic, vibrant destination. We're the third most visited destination in Massachusetts. Yay! Yay for tourism in history! And really feel terrific about the opportunity for us to be able to make historic investments in parks and schools and infrastructure. And one of the reasons I'm excited about the, the chance to serve as your next lieutenant governor is I know there's a symbiotic relationship between the success of our communities and the success of our commonwealth. Mayors like me have been on the front line working to address COVID response and recovery, trying to make our communities more affordable, keep housing affordable. Salem used to be a place you could pour coffee and pour beer for a living and put a roof over your head. That's really not the case anymore trying to make investments in infrastructure, ensure we're thinking about climate mitigation measures, and working to improve public schools. We're a gateway city. I know the value of education, and I know how hard the last two years have been. Kids have been some of the biggest victims of this pandemic. Our educators are feeling worn out. We shouldn't be looking at one community at a time trying to address what the educational needs are coming out of this pandemic. That's the power I think the Lieutenant Governor can be. One of a convener, bringing people together to make sure our communities are working and working well putting together strategies so that we're not alone looking at challenges one city at a time, one region at a time, and certainly the opportunity to roll up our sleeves and be a strong strategic ally to bring economic prosperity to more parts of the Commonwealth. That's the work that I've done as a mayor. I'm really proud to be part of what I call the get stuff done wing of government, where there is absolutely no hiding in a job like mine. You're making decisions every day, oftentimes affecting your neighbors, people that you know, and that makes you a better governor, by the way, a better government, having people in place that you know that are gonna be impacted means you have to explain your decisions and you're working hard to improve the quality of life where you live. 
I want to bring that experience to serve and partner with our next governor and make sure that we're thinking about not only what's happening in the state house and state policies, but how it's going to be implemented locally, on the ground, in communities in a way that's going to impact the quality of life where you live. I'd be thrilled to have your support in this race. Uh, we're really fortunate. The first early polls have us up and winning. We've got over 120 endorsements from elected officials at all levels of government across the Commonwealth. We're working hard right now to try and run a strong statewide organization. Just got our 10,000 signatures certified. <laughs> I commented to some of the other statewide candidates, it feels good not to come in here with a clipboard asking you for your signature. <laughs> Uh, and and uh, just grateful for your time this evening. I'm excited about this race. I think cities are very much a microcosm of the challenges we have at the state. And I want to bring that experience, that sense of urgency to tackling these challenges with this once-in-a-lifetime resources we have to make sure we're spending them well, thinking about accountability, and leading toward longer-term economic prosperity. You can go to kimdriscoll.org to find out more. But grateful for your time and a few minutes to spend with you to share my enthusiasm. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayor. Thank you very much, Mr. Governor. Uh, up next, we have a candidate for Plymouth County Commissioner, Carlos De Silva. Thank you, Judge. Good evening, everyone. It's great to be here once again. Last time I came here, I told a nice uh, Irish joke. No jokes tonight. <laughs> My name is Carlos De Silva. I'm running for Plymouth County Commissioner, and I'm running for one only reason, to expand on my work that I have been doing for the last three decades, serving on numerous board of directors, including uh, the Hingham School Committee, uh, which I am actually ending uh, in uh, two weeks, my uh, six years. Um, I'm running for Plymouth County Commissioner, essentially uh, to create a Plymouth County Climate Action Task Force. As I have mentioned before, climate change and environmental protection are cornerstone issues with significant impact on every community, county, state, and nation on earth. This task force will de be dedicated to working directly with our communities and building our efforts to reduce our local carbon footprint and to preserve green spaces throughout Plymouth County, including the county woodlot land in Plymouth. No horse racing track. <laughs> Youth, youth engagement. I, said, I campaigned in 2019 that we must create an internship program where we can bring our youth so that our youth can learn a real skill where they can, uh, we open the doors of Plymouth County government, we open the doors of local government and our municipalities. The youth will learn a real skill where they can put on their resume and eventually once they graduate in college, they can come back and work in our local, local government. We need to um, also increase transparency and engagement. The commissioners should establish and publish a leader calendar of our meetings so our citizens know this meeting's date, time, and location. Our sessions should be video re recorded. This meeting recording should be made available online and for cable broadcasting throughout the 27 municipalities. Please keep us uh, on your mind, help us win in September. If you could go to, uh, you know, my uh, text me, text me at 781-908-0599. Again, 781-908-0599. Text me. I have a clipboard going around, not for your signature, but for your pledge to support me on September 6th and to put a long sign. Thank you so much, George and the board of the Plymouth County Democratic League. This is a fabulous job. Keep it up. Thank you. Petania, Petania in, in, uh, in Polish is questions. Okay, did I figure out how to turn it on? <laughs> Everyone here? See, see. All right, thank you. So we're going to ask a few questions of each candidate. Um, so Carlos, right off the top, what would be your top priority? Most definitely what I just said. Uh, I really believe that we have to find a way of engaging our youth. Our youth is actually the future of the workforce. If we do have an internship program where we are teaching our youth a real skill versus sending them to clean parks, uh, guess what? They will apply those skills 
in, in everyday life. Um, I am a huge believer, working for the Department uh, of Unemployment, that uh, individuals need to be given opportunities and build up the resume. Unfortunately, a lot of the youth are finishing college and they don't have many skills to highlight on the resume. If the county government can open its doors to the youth, those youth is going to come in and we can transform Plymouth County into a new stream of revenue through grant writing. I spoke about this in 2019. As a result, the commissioners took advantage of the loophole and applied for the CARES Act. As a result, they were able to get $90 million. That is something that I have been advocating for quite a while, uh, and they now we need to continue. Because the commissioners went back to status quo with having an $11 million budget. We need to find new ways of bringing new, new money. The youth writing grants and learning new skills. We can then provide new services to the seniors, to the veterans, to the homeless, and to the youth. Thank you. the horse racing issue on county land for those who may be unfamiliar with the issue. Thank you for that. So on um, approximately March 31st, the commissioners held a meeting um, and on that meeting essentially they, uh, they went in, there were several individuals from the community um, that wanted to protest and talk about the horse racing track against, and this is residents of Clement. Unfortunately, the commissioners shut down the meeting went into executive session, which is, they are allowed by the law. Uh, and uh, they uh, come back from that executive session and sort of like just mentioned to the community that they just voted to award the contract to a vendor. And the vendor essentially will, uh, the proposal is to build a horse racing track there. They did not seek the input of the community beforehand, or even at that meeting, obviously, and, uh, and it's not, you know, a right thing to do. Uh, you know, elected officials need to remember that they're there to serve the community. If it's something that's going to affect the community, they need to seek input and buy in. Now, I'm a huge believer that we need to create new jobs, union jobs. Jobs that pay a decent wage. Thank you. So, I want people to, I want to be clear that I'm a huge believer that whatever we do, we need to make sure that we have a union at the table, right? But building uh, a horse racing track where it has proven that no horse racing track has survived anywhere in the West uh, is not the right thing to do. This is not a moment for us to be thinking about gambling. We have a lot of people, not just young adults, we have older adults dealing with social emotional issues. As the stock market crashed right now, in the last few months, many people that were doing very well in December, those money are gone. Those people are facing a huge issue. But then, if you build more casinos, because that's what they're gonna turn that into, at least they go. Then guess what? More people will be uh, troubled. Unfortunately, gambling affects mostly the individuals with less money. So, uh, you know, that is something that should not go through. And I hope that uh, the officials in Plymouth will uh, object to that. And uh, there is a referendum on the, uh, on the, on the uh, ballot on May 21st. I personally urge all residents of Plymouth to go out and vote against this. If you are being told that that's going to bring revenue to Plymouth, that is not a true fact. Don't let anybody mislead you. That is not a good thing and will devastate the community on the long run. Thank you. For the last question, you mentioned that mitigation of effects of climate change is a priority for you. What exactly would you do as commissioner to address that? So, I am a member of the Hingham Climate Action Committee and the Hingham Net Zero. And, uh, you know, everyone has been talking, it seems to be a, a buzzword amongst a lot of politicians. Uh, but the truth of the matter is that we have to start with our own selves. You have to actually do an inventory of what you're doing at your own home. Start with your own home. 
So make sure that everything that you do, you're driving, I'm not going to name the car, but it's a nice electrical car. I, I drive a, a nice little cheap car, uh, Prius, Toyota Prius hybrid. And let me tell you, I have a solar panel on my car that runs actually the AC on the car. That's, I'm contributing to reduce, reduce the carbon footprint. My swimming pool, I convert that to salt water. Guess what? I'm not putting other toxics, toxics into the air. And so we need to do that. We can do that at the county level where, you know, creating this task force, we would work with the uh, towns, a lot, several of the towns already have the sustain, sustainability director, they have the programs in place, but they don't have resources. We need to create a cooperative like was done on the Cape, where the county government will facilitate the purchase of equipment at the renewable energy equipment that you know, we can sell uh, to the uh, municipalities at a discounted rate. And the county commission, just like they do with the automobile, because they have a nice uh, automobile purchasing program where the municipalities are able to purchase automobile through them and they take a little piece of the pie. So that's essentially what I would do. I would create a cooperative where you know, uh, the municipalities are part of it, and uh, we will try to uh, bring home that, you know, and try to hire a sustainability director at the county level that that person can also empower all the, the towns to you know, apply for certain grants. There is plenty of free money out there. We need to go after that, and the way to do it is to hire a sustain sustainability director. We just did that in Hingham, and that can be done at the county level. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carlo. Thank you, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, our next candidate who's running for Pullman County Commissioner is an Abington Selectman, Alex Bizanson. Alex? Thank you, George. Thank you, PCDL. Um, I have to um, say that I was the chairman of PCDL up until November. And uh, George and his new board of directors have taken over, and they've done an excellent, excellent job with the events that they've been able to do since uh, the COVID slowdown. So I do appreciate that and uh, compliment them. But my name is Alex Pazanson, and I am a two-term selectman in the town of Abington. I'm currently the chairman of the Abington Board of Selectmen. I spent 15 years uh, as chairman of the Conservation Commission in Abington and also as a water commissioner. I've worked with uh, the former mayor of Brockton to uh, increase the sewer capacity for the town of Abington. And uh, as a selectman, we've, we've been able to receive over $2 million to help uh, with uh, joint water works with the town of Rockland. I have experience working as a regional leader. Um, we uh, recently, Abington, uh, joined the regional 911. And as a county commissioner, we need to do more regionalization. Uh, COVID had taught us that we can do that, and that's what we need to do. We need to do more regionalization for especially the smaller towns out there, uh, Carver and uh, Plimpton and, and the smaller towns that, that, that need more of the regionalization uh, things, not just the car purchase, as Carlo mentioned, but uh, you know, what can we do to help them with their water? What can we do to help them with a, a sewer system with, that a lot of these towns don't have? So there's a lot of things that the current county commissioners have not focused on, and I think we need to do that. My name is Alex Bazanson. My website is alexbazanson.org, and you can also find me on Facebook. Thank you. The county commissioner is, I explain it to everyone, it's similar to being a selectman, but for the whole county. And there are only three county commissioners for the entire 27 communities. And they do have an advisory board. Each one of the 27 communities appoint one of their selectmen or the city councilor as one of their advisory board members. And I am that member in Abington. And those 27 people elected me to the executive board. So we have three county commissioners, the executive board and the advisory board. 
But basically, uh, they do the same as your selectmen do in your town or your city council, but for the whole county. You mentioned the potential racetrack in Plymouth. This is certainly a hot topic right now. Can you tell us what your position is on that? Yeah, it's a very hot topic with me, too. And I'll tell you why. Because I am on the executive board, and I am on the advisory board, and I heard about this on WATD. And the current chairman is Sandra Wright, the incumbent Republican that needs to be removed in November. And that's my job to do that. I'm the best candidate to do that, and that's what I intend to do. But that being said, uh, I heard about it on WATD. We had two executive uh, advisory board meetings prior to that, and it was never on the agenda. And what they did is they put out an RFP for the best use of the land, and there was one response. So the commissioner signed a $450,000 three-year lease with this company so they can do their um, investigation and the best use. There's no secret they want to do a casino and a horse, horse track there. And I'm totally against that. I think the people of Plymouth will vote it down, and I don't think it's going to be an issue, to tell you the truth. And last question, could you just elaborate or go more in depth Maybe, um, what do you think has been your biggest accomplishment as an advocate selectman? Well, actually, my biggest accomplishment was when I was elected to the board in 2015. I got a call one night from Matt McDonough to go to an opioid um, yeah. event in um, Duxbury or Kingston, I'm not sure where it was. And I wasn't too familiar with the opioid crisis, but I learned a lot that night. And I went home and uh, I was talking to my wife about it, and I said, we have to do something. Um, several of my son's friends had died of overdoses, and um, so we formed a um, group, and we had a meeting at Abington Town Hall, and we had 75 people at the first meeting. After that, we formed the Abington Substance Awareness Coalition, and with that, uh, with um, the goal of early education, and helping people get into recovery. And all during COVID, I was still getting phone calls and placing people in uh, uh, programs. And we were able to get a $50,000 donation, so we started a Boys and Girls Club after school program in Abington. So I'd say that's my best accomplishment. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Anson, Ryan, for Plymouth County Commissioner. We have another uh, candidate here running for Lieutenant Governor. Um, Senator Adam Hines. Senator, please come up to the podium. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, George. Thanks, George. Um, the, the fact that we're the fact that we're all back here uh, really is a testament, George, to, to your work to to get the, the committee working and the executive board. Uh, so we're all indebted to you, Democrats around the Commonwealth. So thank you for doing this and having us. Uh, yeah, good round of applause. It's nice being the, the entertainment in between the, the, the candidates getting the tough questions. So I'll just say a, a quick hello. Uh, I'm State Senator Adam Hines. I, I currently represent the 52 westernmost municipalities in the Commonwealth. We have a number of our colleagues here. Senator Moran has come in, standing next to Senator DiZoglio. Senator Keenan came in as well. Uh, of course, great Senator Brady you'll be hearing from. We have a bit of a, a, a caucus here. We can have a, a vote on, on the budget that we're going to be doing in two weeks. We can start that right now. Um, Look, I'll, I'm, I'm in this race for a, a simple reason. If you're like me, it, it feels like the issues that we're confronted right now are incredibly big. The divisions in this country are getting worse and worse. And the impact is we seeing direct attacks on a woman's right to choose. We have, exactly. We have people asking the big questions of why is it that in Massachusetts, this is one of the most expensive places to live in the country right now. Or why is it that this is also one of the most unequal places to live in the country right now? And so we're asking these big questions at the same time that we're putting aside billions and billions of dollars. Literally, we're in the process of that in the legislature right now for the next administration. And it's my view that we need leaders who are going to ask the big questions, take on the tough issues, 
And there, we don't need folks who are going to do more of the same, more of the status quo that we've been dealing with that got us here in the first place. I've, I've spent my career doing that. Uh, I worked for the United Nations in the Middle East, involved in conflict negotiations uh, for 10 years in, in Iraq, in Jerusalem, and Syria. Maybe you've heard me joke that, you know, nothing prepares you for taking on big issues here, quite like holding your own in a negotiation with the foreign minister of Syria, especially when they're attacking their own citizens. And uh, so we've taken that and tried to come back home and have that impact here um, in Pittsfield, where we started a program for high-risk youth and more. In the Senate, we've been taking on big issues as well, related to transportation. We're going to have a new train service in my district because of work I've been doing there, and start a new line item for education. Exactly, trains. <laughs> Here's the trains. Um, and so, you know, those are the big issues that we need to be taking on. Um, I'll just leave you with a, a personal story. Some of you have heard me talk about this. Um, I'm, I'm the, a new father. My little son, Raphael, is uh, turning a month old, excuse me, a year old. I wish it was a month. We could control him. Um, a year old this week. And it really changes your perspective on this. You know, it, you were fighting for racial and social justice with the urgency of now, but certainly for the next generation, so they can experience it differently. And my son is a part of the migration story. My, my wife's grandfather came from Mexico and drove trucks his entire life so that my son could have every opportunity available to him and that his, my wife could have every opportunity. And yet that type of intergenerational economic opportunity and mobility is almost unheard of. So that's what got me in the race. I'm looking forward to fighting for you, fighting with you, fighting for every corner of this commonwealth. Uh, Adam Hines, running for lieutenant governor. Good luck, candidates, um, and thanks for having us. Thank you, Senator. Thank you very much, Senator. Adam Hines. Um, next, up next, I'd like to uh, introduce a great senator from Falmouth, uh, Sue Moran. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, George. Uh, as my uh, colleague, Senator Hines said, really amazing job pulling this group together and to have you all come out and be interested. I think that, um, you know, it, as he mentioned, I'm, I'm from Falmouth. I right now have six towns split on both sides of the canal. I'm adding two more. I started as a selectman and became chair and worked for county government. I basically kind of put everything through an economic development perspective, which we very much need right now. I am the um, one of I'm the female lead sponsor of the Senate for the Common Start MA legislation, which is to really help particularly women get back to work, help families so that they can afford their rent or potentially even young families buy homes because they won't be spending quite so much on childcare. The, the most important thing I want to say at this forum, other than it's amazing to see so many people and, and the respect I have for the folks that are running, is just in this point in time we have an opportunity. Senator Hines mentioned the attacks on democracy that we are enduring right now. My answer to that, and I'm, I'm a career litigator, my answer to that is outreach to independence. We need to really broaden our circle, and that is gonna be the success of Democrats going forward. So thank you all for being an integral piece of that, and um, th this is just an amazing forum and group, and so thanks uh, to all of each and every one of you for all you put into it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah Moran. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Up next, we have another senator. I'd like to say a few words. Uh, senator Brady from Brockton. Senator Michael Brady. Thank you, Senator. Senator Michael Brady. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let's give George O'Toole a round of applause. You know, going through COVID the past couple of years has been very difficult for a lot of families, and hopefully we get back to some normalcy, but he's taken the reins to get Plymouth County up and back working and, and to expand the league and get a lot of good people, and I want to thank all the people on the Plymouth County Democratic League and all the people here tonight, because I know everyone's schedule is busy. I just come from a retirement event for a friend from the Brockton District Courts who was a great... Uh, 
friend of ours and like family, and uh, I know everyone's scheduled a busy. So most of, the, most of you know me, I'm Mike Brady. I'm your state senator. This is part of the district I represent in Hanson. My district currently goes from Northeastern through Brockton, Whitman, Hanson, all the way to Hanover down to Plimpton. But next year the district is changing a little bit. They're adding the towns of Avon and a couple precincts in the southern part of Randolph in the district. So I want to, I've, I've had tremendous support from a lot of friends in this room tonight, but I want to ask for your continued support because nobody does alone. And I want to thank all the candidates showing up tonight too. You know, we have a great group of senators and legislators here in the House that nobody does this job alone and we, we get things done because we work together. I, I used to use the analogy when Tom Brady played for the Patriots. He didn't win it alone, but he had a great team behind us. We have a great group of legislators and that's why we have delivered the largest increase of unrestricted local aid into the Commonwealth that will help cities and towns across the Commonwealth, like towns like Hanson and Halifax and Whitman in cities like the Gateway Cities in Brockton, and we're putting more money into public education. We passed the Student Opportunity Act, which is the largest increase in public funding for education, but it doesn't take care of the towns as much as the cities. It's great in Brockton, so that's why we passed this funding for unrestricted local aid, which will help the towns. And I want to continue doing the work that I've always done. I'm grateful I've had a lot of endorsements from a lot of elected officials in the room. Congressman Lynch has endorsed me, many labor groups, the mass nurses, uh, many other groups out there, and I cannot do it alone. I want to thank everyone for your continued support. I want to continue to do what I've always done and work on your behalf. And the most important thing is, that's why we have two ears and one mouth, the most important thing is to listen. And I've been out meeting with my constituents all across the district. I constantly meet with my constituents, whether it's in the morning at breakfast shops, after meetings at night. I'm here for, on your behalf, and I want to continue to work on your behalf. So. I come from humble means, as most of you know. My father worked in the construction industry, and my mother sits in the factories and the clothing industry. And you know, the winter time, they didn't know if we even have food on a table when the construction industry was ready. Never mind Christmas friends. And I know what it's like to come from a, uh, a less fortunate family, but I am so grateful for all the support I've had from all of my friends in this room. And, and I wish all the candidates the best of luck. But uh, I'm going to continue to do my best to work on your behalf if I get, get re-elected. And I'm asking for your continued support because, as I mentioned, no one does it alone. So thank you for having me here tonight. I look forward to sticking around, listening to our friends here. And uh, I hope to get your support as I run for re-election this year. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Brady. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Brady. I'd like to announce a couple of people here. Um, we have uh, we have uh, John Buckley, registered deeds here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Also, so I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Representative Tammy Gouvet, who's running for Lieutenant Governor. Uh, Hello, thank you, Representative. Thank you so much, George. Thank you everybody for being here this evening. It's an honor and a privilege to spend a few minutes with you. I am State Representative Tammy Govea. I'm running for Lieutenant Governor, and the reason why I'm running is I believe that we deserve leaders who are putting our health, our well-being, and our dignity at the heart of decision making. I was very lucky in that I grew up in a family that was a union family. My grandfather was in the Carpenters Union. That allowed my family, thank you. I think you might have last time I was here in this very room. Um, but it allowed my family to be on solid economic footing. My parents were able to buy a two-family home. They rented out the upstairs apartment. They could stretch their wages and weather the economic storms of the 70s and the 80s. That was not the case for so many of my friends and classmates and neighbors whose families really struggled with the indignities of intergenerational poverty, structural racism, and xenophobia. I'm now a state representative, and I have been fighting like hell for working families because of the way that I grew up and because of the indignities that I saw as a young person and because of the ways that we have not made the investments in our social safety net that we have needed to make. The reason why we have the housing crisis that we have today is because we haven't been investing in humane and affordable housing. 
The reason why we have the mental health care crisis is because we haven't been investing in mental health care and the mental health care workforce. The reason why we have the child care crisis that we have is because we haven't been investing in our child care workforce and our child care system. As your Lieutenant Governor, these are three of the five things that I really want to tackle, focus on health, well-being, and dignity of every single resident, forming working groups to address the climate crisis by putting economic and racial justice at the center of our response and the ways that we are solving and addressing the climate crisis. As I already mentioned, education and childcare, mental health, housing, and I'm now a doctor of public health, so I know a lot about the, the pandemic that we are in the middle of. And believe me, I will take my experience to address and ensure that we have a just response to the COVID-19 pandemic. I've been a single parent for 14 years. So a lot of the financial struggles that our families are facing today, and quite honestly, that families have been facing for decades, are ones that I have lived through. Figuring out how to steal from Peter to pay Paul because I was underinsured like far too many of our working families and our gig workers in our state today. So I will carry with me those experiences to engage and bring people into the decision-making room who have lived experience, who have had those same kinds of struggles so that we can inform our policies and make sure that they are meeting the needs of our very hardworking families all across the Commonwealth because I believe that in a state that is as rich in resources as we are here in Massachusetts, there's no reason why any person or region should be left behind. I'm Tammy Govea, I'm running for Lieutenant Governor. I hope you'll join me in this race. I look forward to connecting with you again. I, this is, as I said, the second time I've been in this room. I look forward to coming back to this room and to Plymouth County again. Be well and thank you so very much. Thank you very much, thank you so much. Thank you very, very much. Up next, we have a great senator out of Quincy, Senator John Keenan. Up to say a few words. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. It's great to be here. My name is John Keenan, and I've had the honor of serving the state senate for the last, uh, coming up on 12 years. And just recently, with the redistricting process, my district changed a little bit. And so the Plymouth County towns that I will now have in my district include Abington and Rockland and the town of Hanover. So I look forward to the campaign in the coming months. I do have an opponent in this race. And so I thought maybe I'd just share with you three quick examples of why it is that I'm running for re-election. And all three examples come from my day today. So early today, I was talking to a gentleman who worked at Fidelity. And he had quite a successful career for himself. Uh, a young man, younger than I, with a couple of young children. And the conversation I had with him was about the work that he is doing to help other people. By almost accident, he came upon a situation where he found that people didn't have access to such basic things as soap, and deodorant, and toothpaste. And so he was in a financial position where he didn't have to work anymore. He became a full-time volunteer. He started an organization that does that type of work, reaches out to manufacturers to get these products that he then distributes through a network, you know, particularly through food banks. And it was just really, really incredibly inspiring. I talked to a young girl today, a college student at UMass Boston, and we talked about the issues of college debt. And that was something that really was important to her. And what I took away from the meeting was not any more information about college debt, because I've had three sons, uh, two who have graduated and one who's a junior now, so we know a little bit about college debt. But it, what encouraged me so much was here was this young woman who could be studying for final exams, and I assume was as well, but reaching out because she wanted to make sure that elected officials knew what not only she was going through, but more importantly, she wanted to make sure we knew what her friends and fellow students were going through. And so when people talk about the next generation, think about her and think about the man 
with the soap and the deodorant. And then right before I left my house tonight, I was on a call with the Mass Organization of Addiction Recovery. And that's an area where I have been involved in most of my career in the Senate, first serving as chair of the Mental Health and Substance Use Committee, an incredibly impactful uh, part of my life. When I got appointed to that committee on my first term, then Senate President Therese Murray said, I know your background when you worked in the mayor's office in Quincy when you were on the city council was in finance. And I know you were expecting to be on Ways and Means or the Financial Services Committee. She says, I know you weren't expecting to be on this committee. She says, but I think you're going to find that it will change your life. And it did. It's been work that I have done ever since then, trying to help people who are struggling with addiction, looking to prevent people from going down the path of dependency to addiction, looking to help people who are struggling with addiction, with harm reduction, helping them with recovery programs, helping people in long-term recovery with housing and supportive programming. In that meeting today, like it is every time when I meet with that group, I walk away so inspired and feeling so much better about the future. They are people who are in recovery and working and volunteering to help others. And so why is it that we do this type of work? Why is it that me and the, my colleagues who are here from the State Senate, my colleagues in government, why do we do this work? It's because we are inspired every single day by the people that we meet. And I really feel that if I didn't try to match their efforts, I would be letting them down. And so that's what it is that motivates me in my work. It's truly a privilege and an honor. And I ask for your help as we go forward in this campaign so that I can continue to do this work to represent the people of the North Fork and Plymouth District and to, again, truly to continue to represent them with the idea, with the knowledge, and with the honor of being their state senator. So thank you very much, and uh, I look forward to having a chat with you. Have a great evening. Thank you very much, Senator. Thank you very much. We have a couple of Democratic uh, town chairs here uh, with Bill Cohen, who's on our board from Plymouth. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. Uh, with the chair of East Bridgewater, Diane Phillips, who's also on our, who's also on our board. And we, also, and we also have Kathy Pasquale Egan, who's the Democratic town chair of Hampton. We have a nice, we have a pretty, uh, Plymouth Town Democratic League board and its offices have an announcement to make this evening. Uh, we're very uh, happy and pleased uh, to announce we are endorsing the Son Hall for District Attorney. Uh, we, we look forward to working with uh, the Son and the DA race. Uh, the League and all people and assets will be working hard on behalf of the next DA of Plymouth County. Thank you so much, George. And thank you all. This is an amazing honor. I am truly humbled uh, by this. Uh, thank you so much, PCEL, and, and all of the Democrats of Plymouth County. This is a movement that we are a part of. It is inspiring and encouraging, and I just look forward to where we continue to go. We, we've got a great pilot here. He's taxied us along the runway, and we've picked up speed, and we've lifted off, and we're going to continue to climb. So give it up for George O'Toole. Thank you so much. I, I, I got to say, you all, this is, um, to the dismay of my campaign manager, this is, this is exhausting. <laughs> But, but not in the way that you think. It's, it's exhausting fighting injustice. Yes. When you look at the rates of incarceration in this country, mm -hmm. it's exhausting. When you look at the significant racial disparities that exist in this criminal legal system, particularly here in Massachusetts, it's exhausting. When you think about the narrative that is used to support tough on crime politics and rhetoric that disproportionately harms poor people and people of color and people who are on the margins of society, it's exhausting. And I know that it's exhausting because I've been fighting this fight. 
ever since I was an assistant district attorney in Suffolk County, dealing with people who have been victims of harm and crime in their community and trying to find a resolution, not only to hold the people accountable who did them harm, but also to make sure that the system of justice worked for them and to do it in a fair and reasonable and equitable way. I've been doing the work even as an ordained reverend in the African Methodist Episcopal Church, ministering to families who have been on both sides of the criminal legal system, whether they've been victims of harm or crime or disruption in their community, or whether or not they themselves or a family member or loved one has been run through this system in a way that is unjust and unfair. I've been doing this work as a civil rights attorney, both for the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights and the ACLU of Massachusetts, handling police misconduct cases and voting rights cases, seeing how the system works well for some and not well for others. And one of the things that we saw when we were working at the ACLU doing the What a Difference a DA Makes public education campaign is we found out that a lot of people really don't know about the most powerful person in the criminal legal system. We did some polling and we found out that four out of 10 voters didn't know that the district attorney was an elected position. But across ideological spectrum, across racial identity, across socioeconomic status, a majority of voters felt that the system treated people differently based on the color of your skin, based on your income, and based on who you know. It is exhausting fighting injustice. But when we told those people about what it is the DA's office does and what it is the DA's office is responsible for, 81% of voters said that they would pay attention in the next district attorney election. And what we saw in 2018 were substantial increases in voter turnout in the five contested DA races in 2018. 33%, 25%, out in Berkshire County, we saw a 125% increase in ballots cast for district attorney because knowledge is power. And so even though it's exhausting fighting injustice, I've got a vision of justice, and that's why I'm running to become your next district attorney to reclaim the spirit of justice. My vision of justice is one that focuses on treating victims and survivors of crimes with dignity and respect and not just a witness in a case. It's one that centers and focuses on transparency and accountability so that the people of Plymouth County know what it is that the district attorney's office is doing and know that the office and law enforcement partners are held to account to the residents of the community as well as holding accountable people who cause harm in our communities. My vision of justice faith fo focuses on racial justice to make sure that we're not making worse the racial disparities that exist in society. In doing my advocacy, I've had plenty of opportunities to hear district attorneys say, well, we're not responsible for the racial disparities that exist in the system, but have done no analysis or no studies to see where the inflection points are in the systems around the decisions that they make that make those racial disparities worse. My vision of justice focuses on harm reduction so that we know that we're finding less punitive ways to deal with people who are struggling with substance use disorder and mental health issues and diverting low-level offenses out of the system into community-based alternatives that get better results for our community. And <laughs> and, and, and my vision of justice looks at community engagement so that the community knows and understands what it is the office is doing, has a level of buy-in and belief in the priorities of the office, and know what it is that is being done in their name. When I was an assistant district attorney, I stood up on cases representing the Commonwealth. You all are the Commonwealth. We are the Commonwealth. The residents of Plymouth County are the Commonwealth, and we need to know that what's being done in our name is fair, equitable, and just. And so although it is exhausting, I'm not tired. <laughs> I'm reminded of the civil rights movement and the men and women of the movement who would chant the refrain, we've been working for freedom a long time, but we're not tired yet. But we've been working for justice a long time, and we're not tired yet. So I need you all, the 
members of the Plymouth County Democratic League, the residents of Plymouth County, Democrats in Plymouth County, to stand up and rise up and to continue to fight this justice fight, this be a part of this movement, to change and transform this system to one that is rooted in restoration, transformation, and healing. So thank you all, thank you for this honor, and let's bring this to the Democratic League. Thank you very much, Ms. Now, next, we have a fortunate to have uh, state candidates that are running for auditor. I may please announce uh, Senator Diana Zaglio, who is running for state auditor. Thank you, Senator. I just want to first and foremost thank Rasan for uh, allowing me to follow that amazing <laughs> speech. <laughs> Standing back there going, oh fantastic, I get to go next. <laughs> uh, but hey everybody, it's so great to be here and what an inspiration uh, to hear from so many great candidates here tonight. And what an inspiration to see all of you out here tonight. Thank you so much for your activism. Thank you so much for being a part of the democratic process. Thanks so much for caring to come out tonight to just hear from us as candidates. Uh, we can't do anything that we do without you. So I just want to first and foremost express my gratitude and my thankfulness to everybody uh, for coming out tonight, for hearing from us uh, and taking time out of your very busy schedules. My name is Diana DiZoglio. Many of you have already heard my story and you've heard why I'm running. But for those of you who haven't, I am a senator from the Merrimack Valley. I was born to a 17-year-old single mother in the city of Methuen, right up on the New Hampshire border. Uh, I actually grew up housing insecure. We moved around quite a bit when I was young and bounced around between Methuen and Lawrence for the most part. Uh, and my you know, young mother at the time did the best that she could. She was a young nurse's aide. And I ended up going through the public school system there and then going off to our local community college which was an associate's degree that I was able to afford uh, thanks to our democratic legislature's investments in families like mine. From there, I ended up earning a seat at Wellesley College where I was so grateful to have earned a seat at, but the only reason I was able to actually attend Wellesley was because of a full financial need-based scholarship. And I think it's important to talk about that because it really was due to those financial investments that were made into my future success regardless of my family background, my bank balance, or my zip code. But I was able to actually see some future success. And knowing that really inspired me to give back to my community in whatever way I could. And since I couldn't do so financially, I went into community service. I uh, did a lot of nonprofit work through the years. I had worked in a young teen girl's home uh, as a childhood survivor of domestic violence. I wanted to work specifically with young teen girls who had also survived domestic violence in the home. I also served at the United Teen Equality Center as their cultural arts coordinator, working with inner city youth. And I served at programs like Girls Inc., helping to run their after school programs. But simultaneously, friends, through those years, I continued to do what I did to pay my way through college, which was waitress and <laughs> clean houses. Um, I continued to do those things as more of a side hustle, uh, because as many working families in our communities know, you might love what you do for a day job, but it doesn't always afford you with the opportunity to live with a standard of dignity in the community that you're working in. That's why we owe a debt of gratitude to all of our labor representatives that are here in the room today. Thank you. Thank you. For preserving workers' rights and allowing us all to live with a standard of dignity in the communities that we live in. But during that time when I was doing all these different jobs and juggling these different responsibilities, like many working families, I was offered a job working at the State House in the House of Representatives. And I'll be honest with you, friends, I had no idea what a state representative did. Legislature was not part of my vocabulary. Constituent was not part of my vocabulary. Uh, but there was a state rep who needed somebody who spoke fluent Spanish, which I do, and then also needed somebody with deep community ties. And I went in, I applied for the job, and I ended up getting the job at the State House and going to work in the House of Representatives. And I will tell you, friends, it was like drinking water from a fire hose. I learned about all of the great things that are, yes, you like that example? I used to be chief of staff at the Firefighters Association of Massachusetts, so that's where we get that from. Um, it was endorsement I'm proud to have in this race. But 
I went to go work at the State House and I learned about all the great things that our state legislature can do from investing in early education and care to public education, public higher education, to fighting against climate change, to fighting for a robust transportation system, to fighting for access to health care for all. I learned about all of these things and much, much more during my time working there. But I also learned about the flip side of how government can operate without accountability. And during my time working there many years ago, as a younger woman in my 20s, I was actually sexually harassed while I was working in our own House of Representatives. And the way that they thought it was appropriate to deal with that harassment to make it stop was to dismiss me from my position so the harassment would stop and then require that I sign a taxpayer-funded non-disclosure agreement that barred me completely from talking about literally anything I'd seen, witnessed, or experienced behind those closed doors up on Beacon Hill amongst the most powerful politicians in Massachusetts. But I didn't let them get rid of me or keep me quiet, and I did not leave state government like they told me to do. I instead decided to run for state representative myself, and a little over a year later, made my way back into that same chamber as the youngest woman serving in the House of Representatives. <laughs> And thank you, friends, because when I got elected, it was an incredibly humbling experience, and I knew it was my responsibility to use what I had seen, to use those experiences, to fight like hell for other families in our communities who, like my family was, and maybe for different reasons, but who, like my family was, have either been dismissed or ignored or disenfranchised by a system in state government that's just not working for all families in Massachusetts the way that it could and the way that it should. I took on that battle regarding those taxpayer-funded NDAs. That's a fight that I took with me to the State Senate, where I'm so proud to say that thanks to the support of the thousands of colleagues in the Senate that have showed up here tonight, uh, we've, we've been able to pass my bill to completely ban the abuse of those taxpayer-funded NDAs. And I do want to thank my Senate delegation for that. But friends, not everybody is a fan of transparency and accountability and workers' protections up on Beacon Hill. And there are those who have opposed this initiative regarding transparency and accountability and many other issues pertaining to those issues. I think about during the shutdown alone when we saw precious vaccines funneled to mass vaccination sites and friends of the administrations in the private sector with no bid, no RFP contracts in the millions of our tax dollars. Not only did our families and our local communities suffer without being able to get equitable access, our immunocompromised or disabled, those without transportation. Those folks suffered as a result during that time. But we also had millions in our tax dollars going out in no-bid contracts with no accountability. When that happened, I stood up and I called on Governor Baker and the administration to be more transparent about those happenings. And I called for an audit and an investigation into the millions of our tax dollars that were spent on those no-bid contracts. When the Holyoke Soldiers Home tragedy occurred, as a refresher, we lost 77 veterans due to the mismanagement at that home. And it took a Boston Globe Spotlight Team investigation to uncover the fact that when the administration came before our legislative oversight hearings that we held, that falsehoods were told. When that happened, as a senator, I stood up and I demanded that the administration come back before us under oath and that we utilize our full subpoena authority to get to the bottom of what really happened of course, for transparency, friends, but more so because the families of those who lost 77 loved ones, they deserve the truth, and they deserve justice. And I'll just give one more example, McKinsey Consulting. For those of you who don't know, McKinsey Consulting is a company that has partnered with Purdue Pharma and the Sackler family, and was found guilty in helping them to cover up their contributions to the opioid crisis by willingly lying about the addictive properties of their product, OxyContin. When we found this out, our Attorney General, alongside of AGs from across the nation, stood up and announced a lawsuit against McKinsey Consulting. But this administration, this Republican administration, decided to keep contracting with this company in the millions of our tax dollars. When that happened, I stood up as a senator and I demanded that this administration stop contracting with a company that's not only proven to abuse the public's trust, but that's also contributed to the devastating impacts of the opioid crisis which I know has devastated countless families across our communities, including mine, and I'm sure many of yours. As a state senator, friends, I've been standing up. I've been speaking out. I've been calling for audits. I've been demanding investigations. 
But as your next state auditor, I won't need to just keep calling for these audits and calling for these investigations. I will audit and I will investigate these matters and much, much more on your behalf. Because if there is one thing that I've learned during my 10 years serving now in the state legislature, it is that, and this is actually something I learned more so as a self-employed house cleaner, it is that sunlight is actually the best disinfectant. <laughs> and, thank you. And for as forward-thinking as we really are here in the state of Massachusetts, we continue, unfortunately, to be ranked by almost every good government group as the least transparent and accessible state government in the entire nation. That's unacceptable, friends, and we can do better. But in order to do better, we're going to need to elect leaders who are willing to stand up and speak truth to power and to call for these things and to take action, as strong as possible actions. I have that proven track record of standing up and speaking out and doing the work alongside of you that will only continue and grow if you elect me as your next state auditor. Uh, but I can't be the next state auditor without your support. So that's why I'm here tonight, is to let you know, folks, why I'm running, to share with you some of these reasons, share with you a little bit about myself, and to very humbly and respectfully ask for your support at both convention and in the Democratic primary. I'll be sticking around. You can ask me some questions. And once again, I want to end by saying I'm very, very grateful for all that you do for all of us as Democrats. Keep up the great work, and thanks for having us. Question. So first, um, Senator DeSoglio, could you please um, inform us all who essentially audits the auditor and how does that process work? <laughs> Thank you. Yes, so uh, this is something that we've actually committed in this race to do, is to conduct audits of our own office. I'm not sure exactly how that's going to work out in this moment, uh, but we have committed to start with our own office. And something that I want to look at, uh, which actually we've talked about several times, is uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion in our state contracting. We have uh, a lot of challenges in state contracting, procurement, all of those different things. And we want to make sure that we're actually following a model that works, uh, starting with our own office. But I have not been in that office, and I'd love to see how efficiently and effectively uh, the office is operating. And we are going to take a look at you know, staffing, finances, all of those different things. But also, uh, I have a social justice and equity audit plan that can be found on my website. Uh, and in that plan, I do lay out how I plan to address diversity, equity, and inclusion in state contracting to make sure that we're actually engaging with folks across our communities in an appropriate manner when it comes to issues of equity and fairness. Uh, the state auditor's office should also be engaging uh, in you know, making sure that we're contracting the right way and does need to be itself audited. Uh, so we will be committing to do that, and we will be looking to all of you, actually, to help advise us on the best way to do that, to make sure that it is independent in nature, and that there is actually, you know, some good information that we can get out of that, but it's not, you know, something that we're not going to learn anything new from. So we'll count on all of you for all of that, and I invite you to contact me about that. Many people are aware of their legislators and very visible positions like governor, perhaps not so much state auditor. So how do you explain why it's important? The auditor is the chief accountability officer for the state of Massachusetts. It's the government watchdog. It's the person that stands up and is essentially the whistleblower. Uh, it is your job to manage that office and to make sure that you're essentially the mediator between the communities that you represent, which in this case is the entire state of Massachusetts, and the office of the state auditor conveying information from the communities back to the office of auditor. It's incredibly important because when you think about all the tax dollars that we spend, and you think about how much we all pay in tax dollars, well, a lot of us don't mind, and actually, you know, some of us appreciate investing those tax dollars into our local communities for our public education system, for creating access to health care, for a robust transportation system, you name it, the fight against climate change. The reality is, is that every dollar saved is another dollar that could be invested into those important programs that we care about. So as a state senator, I hear all the time about, we need to invest in education, we need to invest in health care, or whatever it is, right? 
and we hear about that and we go into state budget, which we're going to be doing in a couple of weeks here, and you know, we vote to support these important initiatives in our communities. But what ends up happening is that we end up consistently having a revenue challenge, right? Right now, I'm supporting the Fair Share Tax Amendment, and I hope you all are as well. <laughs> yeah. This will be the fourth time that I, I've voted for this four times now, so I'm excited for its hopeful eventual passage, but we need all of you to support that. But that revenue that's generated, it's very important that it's spent efficiently and effectively to make sure that we're getting the best bang for our buck. You know, we're all contributing to the system. We need to make sure that those tax dollars are spent wisely because we work really hard for those, for those dollars. I just think about even like our state contracts that we were just talking about, making sure that we use the full authority of the Office of Auditor to really investigate those contracts that you know maybe might be being privatized, for example, when we could be doing those same services in-house and saving a lot of money through the Taxpayer Protection Act by investigating where we could save those dollars and taking that money saved and then reinvesting that into all of these services that I know that we care so much about. It's a very important role. And then um, last question quickly. Um, I know you had mentioned being committed to diversity and inclusion with state contracts. Could you elaborate how you would implement that in your own office if you were to be elected as auditor? Yes, certainly. I would invite, uh, you know, I plan on having a task force of folks, advocates, community members um, that deeply care about these issues. And I would be engaging with the Democratic town committees. Uh, for their assistance as well in this. But uh, what I do plan to do is comparing the office's model for DEI goals with that of Massport's right now. Now Massport, you know, I'm not saying that they're a perfect agency or that they have it all together. Um, we're gonna be doing all of these audits and we'll find out where we can do better. But what I will say is that they have a model to follow, which is a 25 point inclusion model where they have specific goals of making sure that they have certain percentages in their state contracting and procurement procedures to make sure that minority contractors are actually having an opportunity to get these contracts and doing that all the way down to the sub-vendors. That's not happening in other state agencies right now. But they have a model that we can look to and at least compare what we're doing to. And I plan on starting there and then building from that. Um, you know, look, we spend billions of dollars on state contracts. Billions and billions of our tax dollars go to state contracts. It's about like 0.005% or something like that, right around there, that actually go out to minority contractors. A few million in comparison with billions. So we have a lot of work to do on that front. And, you know, like I said, we're going to start by examining our own office and then go through the state agencies to make sure that we're doing our part. The Supplier Diversity Office in the state of Massachusetts does some really great work, but they need to be more empowered. As a senator, I was chair of the Small Business Committee, the Community Development and Small Business Committee, and I actually worked alongside of the Black Economic Council of Massachusetts to make sure that we actually empower the Supplier Diversity Office to actually oversee the administration and these state agencies much more than they have been able to. Because what was happening is they were supposed to hold the administration accountable, but they actually work underneath <laughs> the administration. So they were having some challenges uh, that were expressed to us uh, by BECMA that were you know, presenting challenges with them actually being able to effectively do their jobs. If you're under the purview of the same people that you're supposed to hold accountable, it can be a little bit challenging. So we had worked alongside of them when I was chair of the Small Business Committee and successfully drafted legislation that we got passed out of my committee and then that language was taken and we worked on it with my colleagues and we eventually got something done and passed in a law to empower that office. But as auditor, I'll be able to actually work with that office and make sure that you know, they are further empowered by having my office as a resource to work alongside of them and to continue that good work. Thank you very much, Sonia. Thank you. A couple of people I'd like to recognize. Uh, James Byrne is here. He is the chair of the Sultry Young Dems and also right. up the political director of the Sultry Young Democrats. It's a Young Democrats chapter. 
Also, we have the board members are also of the Plum County Democratic League. And we have another board member of the Democratic League here, uh, Celia Nolan, who is the Democratic chair in the hall, who is here. He's also on the board. And also, we have a, the other, another candidate here running for state auditor. Uh, it's Chris Dempsey. Uh, please, Chris, come up, Chris. Chris Dempsey, running for state auditor. Good evening, everybody. There's been uh, a couple of jokes tonight about how the last time we were here was the St. Patrick's Day dinner and roast. And uh, that was really an opportunity for us, with all due respect to this event, to kind of try out some of our jokes as we got closer <laughs> and closer to the St. Patrick's Day breakfast in Southie, which is, which is kind of like the World Series of, uh, of joke making. And I practiced one here that night we were here, and I recited it again in Southie, and it was about the governor. And the governor was there, and he actually gave me the finger. <laughs> the, the Boston Herald has a photo of the governor giving me a finger. So I'm gonna thank all of you for letting me practice that joke. And the joke relates to the fact that there's actually a Republican running for state auditor. Is Anthony Amore is his name. He ran four years ago against Bill Galvin. And his claim to fame is that he is the security director for the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. <laughs> the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum's security director, not an agency known for security. And that's the best that Governor Baker could do in his recruitment this year. But thank you so much for the chance to join you. I'm Chris Dempsey, and I'm running to be your next state auditor. I'm running as the son of public school teachers. And I saw my parents digging into their own pockets to pay for school supplies for their students, as we know so many public school teachers do to this day across the Commonwealth. I'm running with great pride for Massachusetts, all that it has been, all that it is, but knowing that we've fallen behind in everything from transportation to racial equality. And I'm running because I've seen that when decisions on Beacon Hill are made behind closed doors and with a lack of public accountability. That those decisions benefit people who are well connected on Beacon Hill, but they do not benefit families like mine and like yours and the people that we've met on this campaign trail from Pittsfield to Provincetown. So I'm running to be your next chief accountability officer. And I have the background and the experience and the toughness to do that job for you. I served as Assistant Secretary of Transportation for Governor Deval Patrick. I'm immensely proud that Governor Patrick has made a max contribution to my campaign. That is his first max contribution to any candidate running for office in Massachusetts. And we'll that. I'm proud of my record inside of state government as the only candidate in this race with executive branch experience, which is the focus of the job. While I was working for the governor, I co-founded the MassDOT program that created all the smartphone apps that tell you in real time when your bus or your train will arrive. And we made the MBTA the very first transit agency on the East Coast to make those apps available to riders. I know we have some, some bus and commuter rail riders here tonight. But I've also worked outside of state government to stand up to protect the public interest. In 2015, the most powerful corporate interests in Massachusetts got together behind closed doors and they hatched a plan for the Boston 2024 Olympics. And as exciting as that idea was for some of us, when you read the fine print of that proposal, you saw that it required building the most expensive Olympic venues, and that all of us as state taxpayers were on the hook for 100% of the Olympic cost overruns. And as the son of public school teachers, knowing that we have more urgent needs in public education, in public health, in transportation, it did not sit right with me that we would spend $15 billion on a three-week sporting event. And so I co-founded in a living room a group called No Boston Olympics. And it was a familiar story going up against those titans of industry. First they ignored us, then they laughed at us, then they insulted us, and then we won. And we won, thank you, we won because of all of you. We had the facts and the data on our side, but then we built a true grassroots effort. By the end of that campaign, 
we had more individual citizen contributors to our campaign than Boston 2024 had to its campaign. Our average contribution size was 100 bucks. Their average contribution size, average, was $100,000. My takeaway from that effort is that when you put good data and information in front of the people of Massachusetts, we make smart decisions. And fundamentally, that is the job of the state auditor, to dig into the executive branch, to figure out what's working, what's not working, and how things need to change, and then to put that information back in front of all of us so that we can build a stronger commonwealth together. As state auditor, I'll make the office a national leader on climate by making it the first in the country to incorporate carbon accounting into our audits of state agencies. We'll also take on tough issues like reform of the state police. I have great respect for our troopers who are on the front lines, but they deserve to work for an agency that they can be proud of, and we as taxpayers and residents deserve to have an agency that we can trust. I live in the first floor of a triple-decker with my amazing fiance Anna. You can see us on your palm cards on the tables. We're getting married two weeks after the Democratic Convention in Hull. We're very excited about that. And we live about two and a half blocks away from where I grew up and where my public school teacher parents still live. And Anna and I are looking forward to starting a family together. We want that to be in a Massachusetts that is the best that it can be, and that means making Massachusetts state government the best that it can be by making it more transparent, more accountable, more efficient, and more fair, and that is why I am running for state auditor. I would be honored to have your support. Thank you so much for having me today. You mentioned decisions that are made behind closed doors. If you were to get behind those doors <laughs> as state auditor, how would you increase transparency both within the government and to the public? Well, there's so much we can do. I'm proud that our campaign was the first campaign in this race to put out a policy paper of any kind about what we wanted to do in the office. In fact, we put out the first three. You heard me talk a little bit about our plan for climate and environmental justice and a little bit about our plan to reform the state police. That's a 15-point plan that will cover everything from hiring to training to promotions to evidence handling to looking at racial profiling and stops and ticketing. Our very first plan was on $5.3 billion in federal stimulus funding, known as the ARPA funding. That is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to transform our commonwealth and make investments that will last for generations. And I'm guessing most people in this room don't have a great idea about how and where those dollars are being spent. So a day one job for the state auditor is to start tracking those dollars and making sure that we get good outcomes for those dollars with that one time spending. You know, most programs in state government are budgeted on an annual basis. And so you can go in at the end of the year, figure out what didn't work and fix things for the year ahead. We don't want to do that with this one time funding. We don't want to spend all 5.3 billion realize we didn't spend the money that well, but then not have the ability to spend it again. So we will increase transparency on that funding. We'll give people a clear sense of where those dollars are going and whether we are meeting our goals around equity, around diversity, uh, and around basic outcomes for people as we try to build back a stronger Commonwealth post-pandemic. Hi, Chris. Um, I know you mentioned some of the policies that you're focusing on, such as the state police reform and stimulus money. Um, I was hoping you could also touch upon um, your policy regarding reproductive equity. Yeah, thank you. So um, we put out our proposal on that just in the last week, um, in the wake of the uh, leak of the Supreme Court's decision to end Roe. And it's incredibly um, troubling that that is the case. Um, I was 12 years old when a anti-choice terrorist attacked abortion clinics in Brookline. Uh, one of those clinics was less than a mile from where I grew up and where I lived. Uh, when I go to the grocery store, I pass a women's health clinic, an abortion clinic, when I go to the grocery store. Um, it's five or six blocks from my house. So. These issues are visceral and personal to me because I've seen that um, I'm in a community where those, those uh, 
clinics are still protesting to this day when I go to the grocery store. Uh, Massachusetts, thankfully, has safeguarded reproductive rights. There's more work to do, but if the Supreme Court ends Roe, it does not threaten those basic rights in Massachusetts. But there are still ways where anti-choice forces are having an impact in Massachusetts, and there's one particular way the auditor's office can help. There's a concept called fake clinics, which are places that advertise themselves as providing legitimate women's health services, but in fact do not do so. And one thing I've committed to as auditor is to make sure that we are not sending state dollars to those clinics in any way to investigate if that's happening, to help shut those down. So I'm firmly committed to choice and reproductive rights and look forward to being a, a leader and an ally on those issues as one of just six statewide elected officials. You mentioned your initiative for carbon accounting. Can you tell us more about what that would be and why it would be effective? Yeah, so I come at that pr proposal in particular from my work in transportation. Transportation is the number one source of greenhouse gas emissions. It's actually increasing while other sectors of our economy, like housing and industry, are decreasing. So it's a big problem in transportation. But I can tell you that the Secretary of Transportation, the MassDOT Board of Directors, are not putting climate front and center when they are making their decisions. With carbon accounting, we can shine a light on the gap between the promises that we have made as a state and where we actually are. And by putting those numbers front and center for those administration officials and for the public at large, we can hold state agencies accountable for that. I want to make one more point on this. It's not just about reducing carbon emissions broadly, it's also about reducing local air pollution that has enormous public health impacts. And we know from the data that those impacts um, are particularly hard on communities of color. We're proposing to create an auditor's commission on environmental justice that will bring together voices from across the Commonwealth who are on the front lines of climate change. And of course that is going to include people in coastal communities in Plymouth County. But it's also going to include people who live along busy highways that breathe in dirty air from that pollution. It's going to include people that live in Pittsfield, where a peaker power plant that turns on at the times of highest electricity need creates some of the dirtiest pollution. It's going to include people like my relatives in Montague, Massachusetts, live in a very rural area. When their road washes out due to severe weather, they have a 20-mile detour to get to the grocery store. All of those people are on the front lines of the climate crisis. They're all going to be included in our work in this Environmental Justice Commission so they, they can inform the audits that we are doing and ultimately the outcomes that we get as a Commonwealth. Right. Thanks very much, folks. We really appreciate the chat. Thank you, Chris Dempsey, I'm the State Auditor. Just like to recognize a couple of people that are in the room. We have our former Plymouth County Democratic Chair and now our board member, Dave O'Reilly, is here from Hatchfield. Yeah. Yeah. Dave, thank you, Dave. We also have the Democratic uh, Town Chair from Middleborough, who also serves on our board. Rich Young is here. Thank you, Rich. <laughs> we have state committee members here. Uh, Dan Manning is here. Thank you for being here, Dan. Uh, Fred Cohen, he's a state committee member, also on our piece, uh, Plymouth County Democratic League board. <laughs> and we have our Outreach officers, also on the state committee member, John Bowes, who's done an unbelievable work for us. Thank you so much, John. A rock star in the social media world. Thank you, John. I'd like to uh, bring up next uh, a state rep race that's going to be taking place uh, in Brockton. Uh, first candidate to come up, City Council Rita Mendez. Say for the words. Thank you, Rita. Thank you, Council Council Rita Mendez. Hello, it's always a pleasure to be here among so many great people, among friends, and uh, especially to, um, I've already announced it, but especially to reinforce the fact that I am running for state representative. Uh, it's the 11th Plymouth District, and um, it's easier for people to recognize and to familiarize themselves when we say it's uh, Clear Cronin's uh, district, but it's actually due to the redistricting. It changed so much in a way that now it only covers the city of Brockton, which is great because Brockton really needs um, the representation. 
and representation truly, truly, truly matters. And um, I, I learned the, import the importance of uh, representation when I went to speak at our local school. It was the middle school in Brockton. And the principal there called me and said, Counselor, you happen to be uh, originally from Brazil, and for some reason we're having a lot of kids that are coming from Brazil. So I just happen to remember that we have a city council in the city that is, is originally from Brazil. Would you like to come and speak with the kids? I said, absolutely, my pleasure. I had no idea what to expect, but then I, I went there and I said, it can't be that hard to speak uh, for kids. So. <laughs> And um, when I started telling my story of how I got in this country, the same age, there were 12, 13, 14, the same age, and I also did not speak any English, and I went to public school, got a public education, and um, when I was also in my teen years, I, there was uh, an issue, and my mom had to go back to Brazil, but she trusted me that I was gonna do the right thing, and she said, I can just leave you and you're gonna be fine. And I ended up just, just not really so sure uh, where to sleep at night, but then I had a guidance counselor that she said, if everything fails in your life, you know that you can always find a home where I live. I'll just bring you to come live with me. But you're gonna stay in school, you're gonna graduate, and you're gonna be somebody. She went to my wedding. It's a true guardian angel in my life. I do. She helped me pull up applications so that I could go to Massasoit and I got scholarship and I went to Massasoit and I graduated and I started selling houses as a real estate agent and everything was great, the market was great, it was around 2005 when I got my license, 2006 and everything was booming in the real estate market until 2008 came and I lost everything and then the whole crisis in my life happened again. And that's when I told myself I have to go back to school, I'm still young, and I'm gonna have a, a real career. If anything happens, at least I went to law school, because if it all fails, I can do bankruptcy law, anything. But. <laughs> so I did that, but then I only had the associate's degree, then I found out that I need to get my undergrad, and I went to night school, and, and, and then I became an attorney. As I was telling my story to those kids, their eyes opened up, they're like, you mean you're trying to tell me that you also got here in this country, not knowing the, the language, and now today you're actual an, an attorney, you license, and you got, I said, yes, and, and that was exciting, and um, it was a transformation for those kids. But then after that, I left and they were fine. After that, a teacher that was there, she told me, she said, after you went and you spoke with those kids, they changed. They started to get more engaged in the classrooms. They really uh, started to get more motivated and their grades got better. They're starting to speak up and, and actually participate in class because representation truly matters. We need school teachers that really reflect the community that is in there, so that way the kids can know and have hope. So now, it, I have my law practice and everything, but then this opportunity came along. I'm the counselor at large in the city of Brockton, and uh, I just got reelected for my second term. And I know that Brockton needs a true representation in that city from the community. So this weekend is actually this Saturday, my first fundraiser, completely um, politically incorrect, because it's on a Saturday, it's on the afternoon, it's gonna be at someone's backyard, there's a cookout that the um, counselor there from Ward 2 is uh, hosting that fundraiser for me, but it's really to get the community engaged. That community that is not really here today because they do not participate into these wonderful events because they are home busy taking care of their kids, working multiple jobs, don't really speak the language, but they are part of our beautiful city, which is the city of Brockton. And they also need to learn that their voice matters and that they are part of our society. <laughs> that they are truly part of Brockton. And I am so proud to be able to go to that community, 
despite not being born like Cape Verde, not being Hispanic, not being Haitian, being who I am, but being able to communicate with other cultures and getting people engaged whatever tracks of life. Because when we tell our story, we say our, our childhood and our past is broken from dysfunctional homes and people are embarrassed and ashamed of that. But that is who, what truly makes who we are. That's what builds our character. That's what gives us strength. That's what makes us to really fight for what we believe, to fight for difference, because we lived it. We're not really just telling something that we're hearing about, but it's a true story that we lived it. And just when we're here standing, saying, this is possible. This is why I believe in my city. This is why I believe we should invest in education. This is why I believe we can make a difference, because I'm a living proof of that. So I know we truly can. And, and I'm asking for the Democratic support. I'm asking really because I know that we have great things to do in the city of Brockton. And the next time when you come around, you'll see differences. You'll see a community that is alive and engaged. And the next time when we have these events, have people diverse and a, a really a true community in everything that we do. And I appreciate your support and I appreciate being here. The true, true honor and thank you so much. <laughs> will be some of your top priorities if you are to be elected to the 11th Plymouth District? Is yes. <laughs> this is where the fun begins, right? So um, I am um, also the um, Greater Brockton Small Minority Business uh, Association founding member and also the attorney for that association. And what I mean by that is during the pandemic, we had lots of grants and benefits to small businesses that suffer so much because of the pandemic. But what we found out is when, when these grants comes along, it's not really intended or directed for people that have a hard time with the English language. They expect that people who own, who are business owners, they have an attorney, they have an accountant, they have a CPA, they have their taxes in order. So we need to get a liaison, something to really uh, assist these community because they are losing out on important grants. They are the, the ones that are out there, the essential workers. They are out there, they are assisting the community. But when it comes time to really get benefited from our state and federal government with assistance and grants, these are the very same communities that are being left out. And I mentioned education, 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 100% the bilingual system. I find that people are staying there for way too long. And there's no reason why these kids are graduated from high school without speaking fluent English. There's no reason why. We need to really look at that. We have to provide these kids tools so they can go on to higher education, they can go on to college. They need to be thriving in our society and go on whether they're whatever they want to pursue in their lives. So I'm just passionate to get out there and start working. <laughs> you'll have two years to engage with constituents and to work in the legislature. What would a successful term be to you? That is such a, um, a great question. One of my goals when I get there is to really make an effort to go and meet with each state legislator. And people tell me, that's impossible, that's crazy, that's way too many of them. But if I want to get funding, if I want to bring resources to the city of Brockton, I have to work with whoever got elected by their communities. I have to find out where they came from, why they think like that, even if we think very differently. We need to go across the aisle and we need to find common ground. So if I'm there, if I'm engaged, and if I can communicate and they can know who I am and about the city of Brockton, I know I can fight to bring funding and resources for our city that has been forgotten and neglected for way too long. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Rita Mendez, running for representative. Um, I also like to announce that Robert Stevens is here. He's running for state senate in the Norfolk Plymouth. Robert Stevens is here. Thank you, Robert. Also, also running for the representative seat is Shirley Azak. Councilor Shirley Azak. Councilor Azak. Thank you, Councilor. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Well, good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here with you this evening. Thank you to Plymouth uh, County Democratic League for hosting us. And I have to tell you, I am rarely the last one to speak. With a name like Azak, I'm usually the first one, so it's kind of, it doesn't feel, uh, it feels a little weird. So, um, it's nice to be here before you. It's not the first time I've been here um, in this very hall many times uh, with my fellow Democrats. So, it's an honor to be here. Um, I'm going to tell you my story. For some of you that don't know me, um, I'm Shirley Azak. I've served... Uh, I'm, my fifth, I'm in my fifth term at the, as a city of uh, Brockton City Councilor. Um, my parents immigrated to the United States. Well, actually, it, they, they kind of joke, it was a long vacation. They came to the United States in 1977 from Lebanon. And um, I was about seven years old with my younger sister who was five and uh, war broke out in Lebanon. And 44 years later, here we are. So. Um, so I, I have to say, I'm, I'm a proud American. I wear the proud American flag, and I've, uh, I love my country of birth, but um, America is my country, and Brockton is my city. Um, I lived in, so I'm a proud graduate of Brockton Public Schools. Um, I didn't speak English when my parents came here, and neither did my younger sister. But I have to say, I, um, I, I had a very successful uh, education in Brockton. There wasn't anything from even back 44 years ago that Brockton didn't offer. So, um, you know, 44 years later, I'm a college graduate. I graduated from um, a Paris university. I went to college in Europe. And so I'm fluent in three languages, um, obviously English, uh, French, and Arabic. But anyway, I don't want to bore you with all my personal, um, you know, my personal story, but the reason I'm running for state representative is because I love Brockton. In this district, the new 11th Plymouth District is an all Brockton seat. Um, it's a large part of Ward 7, which is the ward that I represent. In Brockton, for the past nine years since I've been serving on the city council, has gone through a lot of changes, a lot of uh, really good changes. We've uh, Our economic development, our downtown is booming. Um, and it's growing. So um, my goal is to continue that as a state representative, if I am successful, um, to continue moving Brockton forward, to do what's best for Brockton. My, um, my goal as a city council was always to be accessible, um, answer my phone, to really um, engage with my constituents. And that's what I plan to do, to continue to be uh, rep to represent them, to be present, to be to be a presence in Brockton, and to do what's best for for our beautiful city. So what I find is that's what brings us all together. Sometimes in Brockton is what we're passionate about, and it's really about our community, about um, you know working whether it's for our kids. We have um, I have great faith in our school system. Brockton Public Schools are amazing, and. Um, you know, I'm looking forward to advocating for increased funding for Brockton Public Schools. I'm looking forward to helping our, um, you know, businesses, small businesses. I'm a small business owner. Uh, the pandemic did affect me greatly, but uh, I know the struggles of a small business. So that's what we hope to do is uh, to continue helping to help our constituents, our small businesses, our students, our families. Um, I mean, that's the title of this job says it all state representative. We, we want to represent them at the state level, do what we've been doing for years. Um, you know, on the city council, I've been representing for nine years, and, um, you know, I've been re-elected five consecutive terms to the Brockton City Council, so I hope that speaks for itself and that hopes that, um, you know, the residents will elect me in September. So September 6th is a very important date. I ask for the support. I ask for the support of my Democratic friends and family. I've been a lifelong Democrat and um, wouldn't imagine having any other letter next to my name. So thank you. Community engagement is, that's what the, the job is. It's very important. And uh, right now, I meet regularly with constituents. 
Um, whether they, you know, they call me, I answer my phone all the time. It's I have one cell phone number, and it, that's all I, that's all I have on me is that phone. And when it rings, I answer. And um, I meet with constituents, whether it's um, at their home or at my home, or you know, if we need to meet at Dunkin' Donuts. It's really I'm um, just answering the phone, and that's what I plan to do. But just to continue that at a, at the state level. I'm sure it's difficult to distill down what a single priority would be for you, but what would you say would be your number one priority in the position? More funding for Brockton. That's all. It's all Brockton. Just we're the only city in Plymouth County, and we need everything we can get, all the help we can get, and all the funding. So I'm going to be advocating for funding, whether it's for education, whether it's for families, whether it's for small business. It's just we need the most we can get. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Ajax, for representing I also want to recognize Rosemary Conley as your select person from Whitman. Yeah. Yeah. So that